Well, thank you for joining us tonight uh, for our conversation with Assemblymember Chris Holden. On behalf of the Bonita Democratic Council Executive Board, uh, I'd like to welcome you all uh, live and uh, those who are enjoying this program via recording on our YouTube channel. Uh, today is Thursday, June 13th, and again, we have Assemblymember Chris Holden joining us. Uh, before we start, just wanted to go over a few items, uh, remind everyone how they can get connected and stay informed with the Bonita Democrats. We have a website, Facebook page, uh, a group that's both private and a public presence on Facebook. Uh, we are on uh, YouTube. Uh, we are on Instagram. And uh, memberships are as low as $10 per year. So uh, for those who uh, are not yet a member, please consider joining us officially. Uh, there is a Act Blue link. Uh, we are past our 2024 uh, membership drive, uh, but you can join at any time. And again, you can join through our Act Blue link. Um, we do also have sponsorship memberships. Uh, and want to thank um, the, the following folks, uh, Derek Bamanu, Dennis Bertone, Tim Hepburn, and Hilda Solis, who have joined at the sponsorship level, which allows us to sponsor uh, up to five free individual memberships annually. Uh, so want to thank those folks who have uh, generously donated this year. Also wanted to highlight our 2024 Local Candidates Victory Fund. Uh, this is a fund that is dedicated to supporting local candidates in their victory. Uh, and we've had quite a bit of success in the 2020 and 2022 uh, election cycles. And we will again be targeting pure democratic households in the cities of San Dimas and Laverne. I uh, wanna thank uh, all of those who have donated to date. Uh, and that information is on your screen share right now. Also wanted to uh, introduce or reintroduce you to our local Democrats who are running in December, uh, Gil Cisneros and John Harabedian. Uh, we encourage you to connect with them directly uh, and support their efforts. Uh, onward to Victory in November, there's a lot of high impact opportunities for all uh, to connect with candidates and support their victory in uh, November. Uh, for those who have their phones handy, you can scan that QR code. It will take you to a sign-up sheet that will let us know uh, what you're interested in, what you're comfortable doing for the upcoming election cycle. That way we can activate you immediately when those opportunities uh, do uh, come up. Uh, and... Also, just a few upcoming dates, just to mark your calendar. I uh, want to remind folks specifically for the Thursday, September 12th, that will be an endorsement meeting for our Bonita Unified School District elections in November. There are three seats open and uh, two incumbents that are running for re-election who happen to be Democrats, uh, but we will also have an open seat uh, and um, that open seat, uh, we can capture that hopefully in the November 2024 election, but that will be our endorsement meeting. And now it is my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce you to our guest speaker. Uh, mind you, this is the short bio. Uh, the long bio would, would <laughs> mean that I would probably be here all night, but uh, allow me to introduce you to our esteemed assembly member, uh, he brings to the legislature a lifetime of experience in public service and business garnered during his many years on the Pasadena City Council, almost 24 years, folks, uh, and the Burbank Glendale Pasadena Airport Authority. He was first elected to the California State Assembly in 2012 and overwhelmingly reelected 2014, 2016, all the way up to 2022. Uh, his district is quite expansive and stretches from La Cunada Flint Ridge in the West, all the way out to unincorporated portions of San Bernardino out in the Phelan Pinion Hills area. 
While in office, the assembly member has championed efforts through his legislation and budget process to improve education outcomes, provide social and racial justice, protect public health, and save developmental disability service providers. Mr. Holden currently sits on the Assembly Committee on Rules, Communications and Conveyance, as well as Utilities and Energy. He is chair of the Select Committee on Regional Transportation and Interconnectivity Solutions. Uh, a few of the leadership positions, he was Assembly Majority for Leader from 2014 to 2016, and chair of the California Legislative Black Caucus from 2016 to 2018. Uh, and allow me to highlight the fact that he has been in a leadership role every single year that he's been up in the assembly. So again, please allow me to introduce you to our guest speaker. Yeah, now, I appreciate it. And Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say thank you to you and also to uh, the members of the uh, Benita Democrats for um, you know supporting me over the uh, the 12 years and well soon to be 12 years and just the relationships we've been able to build and work we've been able to to do not just on behalf of 41st district but on behalf of the entire state. Um, and I do value our friendship and thank you for inviting me to to be here this evening. Well, thank you. And, you know, my first question is, um, welcome back. You, you've been with us on, on several occasions, but most recently, uh, the last time you were with us, uh, you were a candidate for LA County Supervisors District yeah. 5. Um, can you provide a, a, a general election recap from your perspective uh, as a candidate? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, and let me also say thank you to Medina Dems for endorsing the campaign and, the, and our candidacy. You know, this was a, uh, a very interesting race in the sense that uh, with a district that had become uh, such a heavily Democratic district, uh, all signals were there and clear, and I still believe, uh, for a change to have happened uh, now, sooner than later. Uh, um, I was very successful in against an incumbent uh, keeping the uh, LA Federation of Labor from going in her direction. We split uh, the Federation of Labor uh, support, and we were also able to get the Democratic Party's endorsement and a number of clubs, for many clubs throughout the the fifth district. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting about what I learned through this process was one. Um, you better have your turnout uh, because without the turnout uh, and in this particular election cycle, uh, Democrats completely underperformed and Republicans yeah. completely overperformed. And that was not a good mix for, for this district. I mean, even if you look at the, uh, the assembly race, um, the Democrat Herobedian came in second to the Republican that should not have happened because if you get your turnout, it's still going to go to the Democrat. Her obedient will win in November, but um, it was an indication that uh, Republicans were uh, energized. And I, I was concerned about that in this campaign, in the, but from the standpoint that there would still be a presidential primary and you would have Republicans campaigning uh, for the presidency in this area and working with the incumbent that could really help turn out for uh, Republicans. But when it became clear that wasn't the case, we kind of sighed uh, relief. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, they still turned out to support Steve Garvey uh, in high numbers. And um, that strategy obviously worked in that, in that regard. Uh, let me also say, too, that we raised our campaign, raised as much money as the uh, as the incumbent did. Uh, where it turned was that the uh, labor organizations that do business with the county were very vested in seeing that she returned. And they spent some upwards of four million dollars, four to five million dollars uh, when you include those who are attacking me. Um, that's a lot to overcome. 
Uh, and if we had just had the turnout numbers that we were hoping to get, not record-breaking numbers, but just somewhere in the high 30s, uh, we think that would have been enough to pull her under 50%. And then I think she even knew, and that's why I do everything against the wall uh, to, to try to get the election finished in the primary because the general election, you're, we were assured of a higher turnout amongst Democrats. And uh, I think that would have given us the kind of advantage that we would have needed. So without having those who were supporting me uh, from labor kind of match that, uh, we were at a disadvantage. Um, as all of you have seen and know that, because uh, I came home and I was trying to sift through all the mail to find my pieces of mail. <laughs> Uh, I, I, they made her look like she was a lifelong Democrat. And, um, you know, a couple of behind the scenes uh, issues that really hurt me as well was that the um, Planned Parenthood never gave me an endorsement uh, interview. Uh, I had, and, it, and part of it was because the, the affiliates for Planned Parenthood were cut out of the process. So the San Gabriel Valley affiliates who I had their support, had they been given the opportunity to weigh in, were not. It was the LA project that basically drove that and they just basically gave the endorsement to her. Uh, that, was a big, that was a big turning point uh, from that standpoint because you know, in our polling, Planned Parenthood was probably the most coveted uh, endorsement that you could have. So for them, and, and I had a 100% rating on all my votes, Planned Parenthood. And so we were able to garner support from the local folks, but um, it became sort of a battle of who really had Planned Parenthood's endorsement. And uh, it even went to Sacramento and up higher levels to basically say that I could not use uh, the information that I was putting forward. So that, that was a handicap. Um, and then the last piece was that the labor organization of which I was carrying their fast food worker bill endorsed her, um, which is a mind blower in and of itself, considering how hard I was getting attacked from those who did not want to see that bill move forward, who were also supporting her. So, uh, I, I mean, she, has, she was able to get her cake and eat it too. But again, even with all of that, and even with the negative mail that was not true and misrepresentations that I couldn't respond to because I didn't have enough money to do it. Um, if we had just had a better turnout, it would have yielded a better result. Uh, and so that's gonna be a very important underlying conversation leading up to November, uh, because Democrats, if they take this election lightly, it's, it's gonna hurt. Uh, but I enjoyed this process. Uh, we had a lot of support from a variety of organizations, um, from elected officials, Adam Schiff and others endorsed the campaign. Uh, Laura Friedman and many members who are now headed to Congress themselves endorsed the campaign, made a lot of friends in the Antelope Valley and points beyond, and it is a massive district. I can't begin to tell you how many miles I put on my little car <laughs> in the last year. Um, and I'll just say this last point, uh, it was a little bit challenging as it turned out uh, to, to be everywhere I needed to be considering my commitment to my job in Sacramento. So Monday through Thursday, I was in Sacramento and I only had then Thursday evenings, Sunday to campaign, not as an excuse, but uh, so much was going on during the course of the, the week that it took me away from being able to be here in the district and continuing to meet people throughout this very vast district, um, you know, in a more accelerated way. So we had to con constrict a lot of that activity to uh, Friday and the weekends. And then I was back on the plane and headed back to Sacramento. So, uh, and it's really hard. You got to raise a lot of money, but I made a lot of contacts. I made a lot of friends. I have a lot of support um, and everyone's now saying, we hope you do it again. So, uh, we're we're contemplating what that looks like, but uh, the the process was um, was was interesting and, and important because I ran because there are important issues to run on. Um, you know, you look at the uh, central jail, still a problem. 
uh, juvenile detention, still a problem. Uh, an environmental disaster at Ch Chiquita Canyon, that is still a problem. Uh, and, you know, I think that you, we needed to have someone who was going to be, to take these issues on in a more urgent way. I have no nothing personal against uh, uh, the supervisor, but we just needed more energy and more uh, attention to some of the details. So, um, you know, we're going to continue to work hard uh, to continue to put forth our good legislation and run hard uh, to finish this term out and uh, be prepared to uh, see what we can do the next time around. Thank you so much. And, and I, I will join the choir. I, I do hope to see you uh, in, in four years uh, and that name on, on the ballot. So uh, thank it. you for uh, that response. I, I do see that um, our um, mayor, Tim Hepburn, jumped on. Uh, so hey, before Tim. I go to the next question, um, Tim, are you available to say a few things? I sure am. I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello, Mr. Holden. How are you? I'm doing good, Tim. Good to hear your voice. I'm on my uh, I'm on my cell. I'll pop on my video. I got. There we go. Hey, <laughs> there he is. I'm out in this beautiful Laverne weather here. <laughs> um, you know, I I I just want to echo. I it was a tough fight, and I I did not, I didn't like a lot of the campaigns that were run with negative campaigning. I I don't I don't uh, think kindly of it. I I just don't I don't like it. But I I think you did a heck of a job and. You have been such an amazing supporter for our communities and all our communities, especially in the in your your area that you cover. And uh, you've been generous with your checkbook. You've been to our openings and our gold line. You've been a proponent of uh, active transportation. Uh, and you really uh, have been just an amazing advocate for all of our communities. Very readily available as uh, Matt's always been available. You've always been available. Small businesses, like I said, ribbon cuttings. Anything to do with our community, uh, when you have excess funds and we've got a need for it, you're very generous with that. And I, I can't, I can't say enough uh, of of your support and uh, what you've done for us. It's been uh, exceptional, and and I know that uh, with your talents and your experience, that this is definitely not the end. This is the beginning of something new, and I look very forward to that. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to transition to our next question, um, and and it, this was kind of touched on in in reading your bio. Uh, you were first elected to the California State Assembly in 2012, and you term out at the end of this year. Um, prior to your service in the assembly, uh, you served almost 24 years on the Pasadena City Council. Um, while on the Pasadena City Council, and and more recently while you're in the State Assembly. Um, are there any accomplishments that you're most proud of? Oh, wow. Well, if we're going to, yeah, it's, a, it's interesting because when I think of the, the totality of my service uh, in elected office, it's been about 30, it will be about 36 years. And the time that I spent on the city council, as Mayor Hepburn can attest to, uh, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to do some amazing things to uh, address immediate needs uh, of the community. But at the same time, it's part of government, it's part of service that needs to have the support of other levels of government as well. And um, I guess when I was on the council, having redevelopment as a tool was really important to revitalize uh, old Pasadena uh, to bring shopping centers to our uh, underprivileged neighborhoods to build affordable housing. Uh, I'm always, I think we've been for the last 12 years trying to find how, a way to create uh, redevelopment 2.0. Um, we created clinics uh, for the uninsured and underinsured. Um, but having said that, uh, probably the one thing that I would say that stands out that links not only my local city council service to that with the state and the assembly has been the gold line. Uh, you know, and, and quite frankly, when we started back in 1985, it was the blue line and the committee that I was appointed to 
uh, the Light Rail Alignment Task Force. Interesting enough, uh, Rick Cole, who's now back on the council, uh, was on the council and appointed me in 1985. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, but I think it was an important uh, entry point uh, to being a part of what has turned out to be a 30 plus year uh, community locked arm to arm uh, effort to bring this important regional transportation system not only into the San Gabriel Valley, which there was a job of that task force to figure out what route it would take, uh, but as it ex now is extended throughout the entire San Gabriel Valley, uh, it is uh, amazing what the potential could be. Uh, I will just say this, that uh, we sent a letter out back at the end of May, and, I, and, and Mayor Hepburn has been uh, an amazing partner. Um, this is not an undertaking that falls on any one person. Um, it, it is a shared victory uh, for all. But it was also a major commitment along the way to make sure that LA Metro was hearing the San Gabriel Valley's concerns about resources uh, for uh, the gold line. And when uh, regional bond measures were being contemplated to make sure that our project was going to get the appropriate funding in those plans. Uh, and, and I think that what we were able to do, one of the first things I was able to do as an assembly member was bring together the mayors of the San Gabriel Valley to meet with then Mayor Eric Garcetti, uh, who played a prominent role on the LA Metro board to let him know how important it is to not forget our region. The, the, the county is so large and vast and there's so many special interests within every segment. It's what makes California a hard state to work with with the federal government because there's never the kind of unity that they need to see in order to be able to lock in and provide resources accordingly. We usually have projects that compete for funding and that makes it very challenging. Uh, but we were able to get his commitment and he was a man of his word. He stuck with that. He made sure that uh, the gold line was very much a part of that regional funding uh, mechanism. Uh, but then when we ran short, we needed to make sure that we were able to get more money. Uh, uh, Southern California uh, uh, Council of, Gov excuse me, of Governments played a major role. We were able to find some state money. And from that point on, we, I kind of made it a, a, a priority of mine to make sure that the state did its part. Local government had done its part. Uh, had created a lot of funding opportunities for the goal line and the state had not. And so from that point forward, even until today, where uh, the letter that myself and 21 other uh, members of the legislature sent to the budget chairs and the leadership in both houses and the governor to let them know that we wanted them to fight uh, the first proposal that would defer uh, the second year funding for gold line and that it should be guaranteed uh, and so we were able to pass a budget today with that language in the budget now having said that there's still conversations ongoing with the governor but i think that was one of the areas that uh in this budget that we approved today where there was consensus even with the governor so um we continue to stay vigilant but i think we are uh pun intended able to start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel which then allows us to pivot to be in a more focused position of celebrating and community celebrating and planning and doing the things they need to do to engage community as this project then is going to be built uh, from Pomona uh, into uh, Claremont and Montclair. Uh, and, you know, if I had more time on the clock in the legislature, I would be fighting for resources to make sure the project was continued to the Ontario airport. But having said that, uh, you know, this is, uh, we're, we're getting to a place where we can really start to exhale, say just this moment, but we're in pretty good shape. And I, and a lot of that goes to uh, uh, Mayor Tim and, and all of the other electeds in the San Gabriel Valley and members who served on the uh, gold line, the light rail alignment task, I mean, the, the um, uh, uh, the Gold Line Rail Authority, uh, that's all been part of the, the, the ingredients of success in this. And so I would call that probably uh, amongst a variety of other things. And I've 
got a lot of them to talk about uh, is work we did in the, in the legislature, but because that cuts across pretty much my entire 36 years uh, in elected office, I would say that is a standout. Thank you so much. And and I did notice that um, another longstanding public servant uh, in the San Dimas and San Gabriel Valley has jumped on. Uh, former council member Dennis Bertone, thank you for joining us tonight. Would you like Dennis, to say yeah. a few things? I don't know. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Yes. I, okay. Well, I, I went through like to thank the speaker for being such an outstanding supporter of the gold line. It just wouldn't have happened without him. And uh, it is really encouraging to see that our, our leaders take on the, the things that we need for our area. So I want to wish him the best of success and thank him for all he has done for the area and the city of San Dimas and the San Gabriel Valley. And Matt, you're doing an excellent job. Uh, and thank you for your efforts for the Democratic Club. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Well, I, I, I do want um, you, you have uh, so many uh, noted accomplishments. Uh, I, and I, I wanted to highlight uh, one in particular in the um, education sphere. Uh, you have been termed uh, now the the father of of dual enrollment in California. Uh, for those who don't know dual enrollment, another way of saying that is early college. Uh, what does that mean to you? Wow. Well, it, it runs a close second to gold line, and and again, that's in in many ways it, they're different. Um, but that was um, that was an initiative that really kind of caught my attention when I had conversations in the early part of my, my service around 2012, 2013. And I was uh, hearing about how we could create more opportunities to fill the uh, achievement gap, uh, give young people who were coming from um, underrepresented areas an opportunity to understand that college can be demystified and that they can excel, they can take the coursework, they can do it even as a, uh, a high school student. Uh, many of us know and are, are pre uh, recognize the AP program, which um, you know is an honors program where high school students can start taking a uh, higher level of courses in high school, but their high school, uh, they have college uh, application. And if you go through a program, you'll able to get credit and if you pay for a test and then you pass that test, then you get the credit for college uh, through that program. But dual enrollment was more of an opportunity for high school students to have in this legislation under two, uh, AB 288, uh, which back in 2014-15, uh, we initiated. Uh, it was really designed to create uh, up to 15 units of college courses that a high school student could take. Over the years, we've added more college credits that could be transferred uh, for a student. They were able to willing to put in that kind of time. So if you consider yourself a freshman in high school and you're willing to take dual enrollment programs and that it was a difficult conversation to have in terms of working collaboratively with the educators, um, with the community colleges and also with the K-12s to um, come up with a what they call a CCAP is a agreement between the two bodies that really spells out the programs that would be made available, who would be teaching the programs on which campus, whether it's high school or on the college campus for rural communities and even for inner city communities where uh, community colleges are a little bit further from the high schools. It gave an opportunity for that those courses to be taught on the high school campus. We've augmented the program with various bills over the years, which allowed for DACA students to participate. So as we started to see that the program wasn't necessarily uh, reaching all young people as it should, we've made changes over the years, uh, most recent to include court students, uh, foster youth to be able to participate in dual enrollment uh, education as well. And I'll say this year, uh, we actually saw how it can work. There have been examples around the state, uh, young people uh, who are graduating 
high school with their high school diploma and their AA degree, uh, which then for families, it's also an economic relief because as they go into college, they're usually entering then as they're in their first year as a, uh, as a first year uh, junior. So they start, they go in taking their major courses, if you will. Uh, and in Pasadena at John Muir High School, we had seven young people who graduated with their high school diploma and their AA. Um, I went to the Pasadena City College um, uh, graduate, graduation reception, and it was really interesting because I was there to, uh, to congratulate those graduates, but also high school kids who were graduating with these more seasoned adults, if you will. Uh, and so I didn't want to over promote one without making it seem like it was uh, under promoting the other, but it, it's still quite an accomplishment. And to your point, Matt, uh, we put uh, 400, 300 million in the budget a few years ago. So they could, so there could be greater communication and letting parents and families know that the program exists. Uh, we put a bill in this year that allows for there to be uh, more coursework that can apply. The, C the UCs uh, aren't participating quite at the same level as the CSUs. And so we're looking ways to, to, to bridge that gap. Um, but I think I've written maybe five or six bills uh, dealing with dual enrollment, removing sunsets, uh, making it a permanent part of the educational curriculum. Uh, and to see young people thrive under it is, it, it, for it to be my last year and to go to a, a service where I could see how young people were benefiting by it, it's been quite rewarding. Well, thank you so much. And, and you certainly have earned uh, the father of California dual enrollment title. Uh, thank you for your multi-year effort to make that happen. And it is indeed a great thing to hear at graduations, uh, these students uh, graduating with both a high school diploma and an AA at the same time. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to highlight um, a little bit more about your tenure in assembly. In your bio, you highlight uh, several of your leadership positions, but um, you probably ran out of space because you, you've been in leadership every single year uh, that you've been uh, in the legislature. So allow me just to highlight a, a, the earlier one. You were majority whip um, your first two years, uh, majority floor leader uh, following that, chair of the California Legislative Black Caucus, chair of the Assembly Utilities and Energy Committee, chair of Assembly Appropriations Committee, and a longstanding chair of the Assembly Select Committee on Regional Transportation Solutions. All of that is a mouthful, um, and uh, every one of them on, on their own is, is significant. Um, I guess if you could highlight um, one or two of them uh, and, and mentioned uh, maybe what was most challenging uh, and or rewarding in, in any one of those roles. Well, I've enjoyed all of them. I, I certainly, um, Majority Whip was the very first position I had. And whether it's Majority Whip or uh, Majority Leader, you're pretty much focused your attention on the floor, uh, the running of the, uh, of the floor, uh, making sure that any fights between the, the other side of the aisle, that you're up on that, that you're prepared for parliamentary procedures and things along those lines and to make sure that you're uh that, that members to the extent possible um are able to move their bills off the floor so it really more is a floor operational type of position and it had its value and it provided me with a great fundamental understanding of that part of a legislative business um, but when i had the opportunity to serve as a committee chair uh, that created a completely different uh, paradigm shift for me. And uh, even though appropriations is an amazing committee, you get to see every bill um, uh, on both sides uh, of the legislature bicameral. You see all the Senate assembly bills as well as the Senate, and you determine whether they move or not. Um, I always tried to be fair in that role. 
I always try to, even with Republicans, be fair uh, with them. And I think they see that and appreciate that. Uh, but the job that I think I had the most um, uh, benefit from and probably heightened you know, uh, challenges was utility and energy. Because when I took over the position, you know, it was like, I think Jerry Brown was finishing up his term and I served in this role for five years and Gavin Newsom was coming in. And I'm not gonna say what I said because of who was coming, <laughs> was going out, but it's just seemed like everything that we had been thinking about and talking about as it related to uh, clean energy, uh, getting ahead of climate change, fighting carbon emissions at every level we could. And the gold line is another example of an important transportation project that does that. But it seemed as though everything that could go wrong uh, did during those five years. And I, and I say it's only because we started to see high heat events um, where Western 14 states were hot and experiencing heat waves all around the same time. Uh, wildfires became catastrophic wildfires. While I was chair of the committee, eight of the largest of the 10 uh, historic fires for the state, eight of them happened, uh, eight of those 10 happened during my term. Uh, utility caused in some cases and other cases not. Uh, but those that had uh, utility causation, down power line uh, or you know, because as a result of the heat and, and, and Mother Nature basically accelerating uh, her fury, um, you had uh, high hurricane force winds that would rip through the, the canyons, uh, take out poles and sling them the, the length of a football field. Uh, those live wires would hit the ground and there you have it. Um, so a whole host of reasons that these fires were happening, but because of the vegetation on the ground and the wind that was moving the par uh, par uh, Paradise Fire, when I visited that site, uh, you could see at the top, the trees were green. At the bottom is where they were scorched because the wind was moving them so fast in the communities. And so those type of things uh, put us in a position where we needed to figure out how do we deal with liability of the utility. Uh, we had the largest utility in the the country, PG&E, went into bankruptcy. We had to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, because of the high heat events, uh, people were using their air conditioning at 11 o'clock at night in Central Valley and other parts of the state. And it put an amazing pressure on the grid. And in 2020, August of 2020, we had rolling blackouts because we didn't have enough power on the grid to, to meet the demand at that time of the day. Um, and that was... That was, a, that was sort of a wake-up call to the governor, uh, to our energy providers, uh, energy agencies from the CPUC, the CEC, the Energy Commission, and the uh, CALISO, the, the, uh, the grid operator. They were not talking. We had to bring them together, make sure that they were doing better forecasting. We had to create, through a bill that I initiated, uh, 1054, um, we had to put wildfire mitigation plans out there so that utilities could demonstrate what they were doing for uh, hardening their uh, infrastructure, undergrounding uh, lines, uh, technology that can do a better job of predicting high wind events, uh, de-energizing power lines when they knew that the power, was, when winds were going to hit at high levels so that if something went down, it wasn't live wire. Uh, that was always a challenge in and of itself because these utilities were awful in terms of segmenting where they needed to shut power down and they would shut it down for large swaths, especially PG&E and Edison to some degree. Um, and that was impacting on businesses and other people who weren't really in a high fire risk aid, uh, impact area. Uh, so with all of those type of things happening, um, managing new markets, uh, setting goals like SB100 uh, to uh, get to 100% carbon free on the grid by 2045, trying to accelerate that, uh, moving from the utility side to the transportation side and looking at uh, EV productions, uh, 
uh, charging stations, what we needed to do to get infrastructure up and around this. So we were creating markets that didn't exist before. Wind and, and solar were pretty much it. Now we're looking at offshore wind, lithium development, geothermal, uh, lithium development to help us get in a position for battery storage to have long duration uh, battery usage, which is a game changer. You go from four to eight hours of, of being able to draw on uh, solar power to uh, three to four days. Uh, and, and we're getting to that place and, and technology is becoming our friend. Uh, decarbonization. I mean, all of these things are, were part of the conversation and still are. Uh, but I think we've been able to do some important things. One, to, de to, to take what was at that time a destabilized utility marketplace and, and to uh, get that utility out of bankruptcy, create a fund, which they've not yet had to draw on, thank God but it's there to absorb some of the liability potential that could happen uh, going forward to keep them a viable uh, producing utility. Uh, and, and so Edison, you know, look, uh, I'll put it this way. Had we not been able to get PG&E out of bankruptcy, which nobody really liked PG&E anyway, but to the extent that there was a, their, their service was such that you had to kind of get them back up and going again because even though there are ways of breaking off pieces of it, you'll never be able to do anything with the high risk area because that's where the liability is. But if we had not, then that would have put pressure on uh, Edison and then San Diego Gas and Electric because uh, the markets would have reacted, the, the cost of borrowing would have gone up and the inability for those investor owned utilities to be able to meet their demand would have put them in the same kind of peril. So the fact that <clears throat> none of that happened, <laughs> that the, the headlines never became, you know, lights or, uh, you know, the marketplace is destabilized, the potential for more rolling blackouts was greater, uh, never got to that place because we were able to figure out the, the fundamental pieces and uh, and I think I still think putting out strong, aggressive uh, goals to and accelerating them where we can, I think, is uh, is going to be critical. But I but that was the one position to your to answer your question, Matt, that uh, way too many times I went back to my my little studio apartment in Sacramento. I stared out the window and not knowing exactly what to do. I mean, everybody was kind of in that from the governor, all of us were trying to figure it out. But to the point we got to the other side of all of that and we figured it out, uh, that creates a, you know, a sense of exhilaration that we met a moment and, and we were able to, uh, to create a pathway uh, to get to the other side. And, uh, and that's what uh, that position and the challenges that it represented uh, brought to me, and I can tell you a lot of stress. Um, but, you know, those are the things that make you stronger because now you have the experience of having gone through them and you're on the other side of it. And uh, big issues don't, I've never been too afraid of tackling big issues. Uh, we had similar situation with Pasadena Water and Power back in the early 2000s when deregulation of the marketplace basically had us in a position where we were supposed to sell our utility, but that provided jobs. We had the lowest cost of power, lower than Edison. Uh, so why would we want to do that? We needed to fight for it and we did. And at the end of the day, it turned out to be market manipulation from Enron. So that whole concept of deregulation, lower prices uh, to repairs was just a lot of uh, used car salesman uh, tactics, and and we came out of that okay. So uh, I think that's where I learned the most, uh, and I think we were accomplished some very important things as a result. And the work continues. Thank you so much. Uh, and you know what? I, I I see that our immediate past president uh, and current Ontario Montclair Teachers Association president is on uh tracy are you available hey. to say a few things hi or or 
Did you have a question for Mr. Holden? I can hi. say hi. I can say hi. <laughs> hi, Tracy. Hi, Mr. Holden. Um, I'm sorry. You know, I Tracy, late. we've I... known each other. Tracy, we've known each other a long time. <laughs> I think you can call me Chris. <laughs> well, I, I generally do. That's why you heard your name screamed in the hallway that day. I, yeah, I know you do. I know you do. I appreciate it. <laughs> anyway, um, I apologize for being late. And I look forward to hearing the um, recording because the tail end of what you're saying was just fascinating to me because I know um, here in California, we like to be leaders in our country and generally we are, but I know the um, the power system had some issues that we had to take care of. So, and yeah. I'm grateful to all of you for seeing us through it. Thank you. Um, Matt, this is Dennis again. Could I say something? Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> as you know, I was in education for 32 years, so I know something about it. And I really appreciate Chris's knowledge and support for the community colleges. I think they are the most unutilized that we have in our educational system. I think they can be used more. It's a great opportunity, as he said, for people that can't afford to go to a four-year college, a private or a state, because the state is expensive. So I really appreciate that. I think most state legislators ignore them and you haven't ignored them and I think you've helped bring them out as something very important. So as an educator or a retired educator, I would like to thank you very much and I, I appreciate it and I understand how important it is. Thank you very much for that. Well, well thank you for that, Dennis. I, I will say too that the community colleges have really benefited uh, by from dual enrollment because it actually helped their enrollment uh, during and after the pandemic, where they saw the enrollment drop off, dual enrollment kind of filled in and caused those numbers to kind of flatten out or, or go up. And uh, so many of the community colleges have said, if it were not for dual enrollment, they would have taken a big hit um, in this transition from the pan through and uh, through the pandemic. So uh, I just say all that to to put an additional emphasis on what you said that. Uh, community colleges are an uh, amazing asset, and um, this seems to be a good uh, tool to help elevate them in their importance, but also to make the resources that they have available uh, highlighted as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for that. And and I, I did also notice that um, we, we have um, a, a veteran uh, grassroots activist who is a champion for democratic values, candidates, causes. Uh, mm -hmm. Zephyr Tate Mann is is on hey. the Zoom tonight. Um, are you available to 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 say a, a few words? Hey Zephyr. Thank you, Matt. I'm not too sure I want to be called a veteran though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Good evening, everyone. And of course, I was disappointed that. My candidate, Chris, was Assemblyman Chris Holden, was not elected as our representative to the Board of Supervisors. Mm -hmm. So I just um, say the same thing that many people say to my husband, who is a uh, war veteran. Thank you for your service. Uh, thank I you. I appreciate to you being elected um, next time around. And of course, we will be here to support you. Thank you, Zephyr. I appreciate it. I have, it. have kept in touch with uh, your accomplishments and some of the things you haven't mentioned yet that I logged into my memory that you have done that was remarkable and in things right. past. So, um, Thank you. yeah, don't yeah. stop now. I, <laughs> More I, work ahead. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not done. I'm not done. I've got, you know, Zephyr, I think, as I said earlier, uh, the reason I, I mean, that's a tough job, uh, supervisor. I mean, every tough issue uh, runs through county government and because of the size of LA County, uh, even more profound, where there's homelessness, mental health challenges, mm -hmm. um, some men's central jail and the challenges there, uh, youth detention centers that are gonna have to close and no place to put the young people foster youth system and how broken that is 
Um, and I guess for me, I always look at these, um, these races as an opportunity to go back to the voters and say, have I earned your, your uh, voter confidence uh, to go back and fix the problems? I, I always work hard to, to be able to respond to community needs because you know, I never view the seat as mine and I, and I want to make sure that if I am doing a good job, that I have something to say and show uh, at each election cycle, um, whether it's through legislation or whether it's through uh, budget victories, uh, like we were able uh, to do for uh, Laverne and, and also for, for Claremont over the years. Um, and, and, the, and, and so I think the, or, or if it's a uh, ballot initiatives and propositions, uh, all of these things I think are important. And I guess I, I didn't see, uh, I mean, I just rattled off a few things and, and, and I not even talk about the environmental disaster out in uh, Valverde and Chiquita Canyon uh, with that land uh, site. And they were given an extension of time of 30 years when they're poisoning the community out there. Uh, so, you know, those are the kinds of reasons why I run. And if I did the job and didn't do the job and wasn't able to come back and show progress, then I probably wouldn't run again. Uh, but, but as long as I'm able to have the energy and, and the desire to tackle public policy and to open up the systems, these dysfunctional systems and try to tackle them and make and make them work better and provide better service to to community then I'm always going to be motivated um, so that's why I ran uh, that's what drove me to run for city council and and then the assembly and uh, so we'll I, I know God's not done with me so we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll keep you posted uh, Matt at yes. the end, may I make an announcement? Will you permit me to make an announcement also? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, right. uh, we are okay. quickly approaching the hour mark. So I'm, I'm going to wrap it up with um, one more question. Uh, and uh, this is to uh, any other current or aspiring public servant. Um, in your bio, you, you mentioned uh, you are the son of former state senator and L.A. City Councilman Nate Holden. Mm -hmm. um, how has his public service influenced you uh, in how you have served? And, and any lessons you would recommend to, to those who are currently serving or aspiring to serve? No, oh, I appreciate that. Um, I'm, you know, I'm very fortunate because, uh, you know, my dad has uh, been in politics and community service and community activities and democratic politics forever. Uh, he ran for office a number of times uh, before he won his Senate race. He ran, had run for Congress, he had run for the Assembly, uh, and he came up short back in the late 60s and early 70s. And so when he was elected uh, in 74, I believe, for, uh, for Senate, um, he it was, it was because he had to take a lot of defeats to get there. Uh, so his staying power, his commitment to fighting for causes, his leadership, even when he became a senator in four years, uh, his resiliency uh, has all been very part of the ingredients that I think anyone needs to have when they want to uh, serve in this way. You also have to have a, a thick skin. Uh, but you know, when I look at the legislative accomplishments that he's had, uh, where he was writing legislation to deal with redlining, when he was writing legislation and successfully writing legislation to create a king holiday, California becoming the first in the nation to have that. And it was his law that uh, created that in California. Um, whether it was writing laws to give women the right to get credit in their own name. You know, at that time, a woman couldn't get credit without a, a brother or uncle or a father or, or someone, a male, uh, signing on for them. So to know that he did that kind of legislative work, and this is to benefit everybody. This is to some of it groundbreaking. Um, and even when he wasn't elected, uh, just his commitment to cause and fighting for the cause. Uh, you know, uh, he was president of CDC and he uh, was in 
involved in the McGovern campaigns and, you know, and, and, and fighting the good fight. Um, so I, 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 I took that on, I guess, like that's part of the DNA in the sense that, um, he doesn't take no for an answer. And I, I don't either. I mean, when you're fighting for, for community that needs their voice to be heard through your actions, uh, then you can't take no. I mean, sometimes it is what it is and you have to come back and say, we live to fight another day or maybe we need to make some changes here and there and strategically plan the next, what the pathway looks like going forward. And I've had, even when we talk about dual enrollment, um, it was the second or third time of putting that bill forward before I actually got it to the governor's desk and it was signed into law. So, and I have a number of bills like that. Um, our criminal justice bills, uh, duty to that came out of the 2020 uprisings and concerns the community was having about, you know, where was equity? What does equity look like and fairness? And so we had, and and how can we look at reforms in law enforcement that are just and righteous without making it seem like we don't respect or appreciate the good work that so many in law enforcement uh, provide? Um, and so we, we had duty to intervene laws. We had don't stop laws. These are all signed into law. And it would, with me working with uh, those who were opposed to it. And, you know, law enforcement was initially opposed. Uh, interrogation of a minor. You know, now California, that's illegal to do because of the bills that we were able to put forward. Um, but it also included working with everyone. You know, a lot of my bills had bipartisan support. Uh, and, but, you know, one of the things that I would say is that, uh, you know, wherever you serve, you know, it's not where you serve, it's how you serve. And it's, it's how you work hard and how dedicated you are uh, to a cause and that you have resiliency towards that, uh, to the outcome and that you're willing to put in the time, um, not be discouraged, but uh, to be encouraged, uh, to learn from what come, you know, what may not be a complete victory, but what can you take away from it? Uh, and I always look at veto messages. They give me a pathway of knowing how I can come back the next time and be successful. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, like with the 1228 and the fast food worker bill, um, you know, I get a lot of pushback from franchisees around that but we're talking about you know people who are having wage theft uh, I mean we talk about the the increase in the minimum wage part which needed to happen but there's also workplace challenges so who fights for these folks you know who elevates their issue they can't afford to have lobbyists take their cause and 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 push it through a legislative process um, so that's where labor comes in. That's where labor unions step in and try to help fill that gap. But you have to have members who are willing to t stand out and see the righteousness behind some of these efforts. Um, I fought for uh, franchisees as a former subway franchisee myself. I fought for them with laws that would benefit them as, as franchisors were trying to take away their ability to get the fair return from monies that they put into their franchise when they were trying to sell their franchise and they needed a law to help them. Uh, and we did. And, 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 and we tried to do it in a fair way. And, and we'd had conversations along the way with the franchise association and the, the key part of that bill, not to get too all over the here, but you know, that was a bill that was negotiated at the end with the franchise uh, association at the table um, with the restaurant association at the table, uh, and then to agree to an outcome, which they should have agreed to initially, they should have never fought the bill because essentially they negotiated what was originally in the bill. They spent more time, energy, and money, um, having outside interests come in, paying them to signature gather, to dismantle a bill that went through a process that was benefiting people. And we say that not just in this instance, but um, Lena Gonzalez, Lena Gonzalez had a, uh, a setback bill in terms of these refineries too close to neighborhoods. And uh, she came under the same attack. 
So there is emerging out of this a, a strategy from some interest groups to say, well, if we can't influence it through the legislative process, we'll just kill it on the other side by referendizing it uh, and take it away that way. And, and you'll see some other efforts that are underway on, as it relates to uh, the ballot this year that um, that's another effort that's being taken. So uh, I say all that to say, my dad taught me how to fight. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I have a different style, <laughs> you know, I'm too big to have his style. I mean, if I was a bull in a China shop, I think everybody would be like, oh my God, you know, but I have my style, but when pushed into moments, that, that fight comes out and I think it shocks some people across the other side of the table, but we, we've been successful uh, building coalitions um, and to be as transparent as I possibly can, as I do all my legislation, as I work uh, with community. And uh, I would just say that um, it's not where you serve, it's how you serve. Thank you so much. And, and, and thank you for fighting the fight for students, teachers, the environment, social justice, and, and just to name a few. So um, we are past our hour allotment. Uh, are there any closing words uh, that you'd like to share before I then transition to Zephyr and her announcement? And then we'll get into the general business of the club. Yeah. Well, let me just say that 12 years goes by really fast. And uh, I remember when I came out to meet many of you for the first time and there was so much excitement. Thank you for making me feel it was all of me, but I know that it was just knowing that Democrats were going to have an opportunity to represent you because reapportionment had drawn the lines differently and Republicans were then marginalized and were not going to have the same impact on representation of uh, the various communities uh, in the eastern part of the district that they once did. And that ushered in an opportunity for Judy Chu, for an Anthony Portentino, and for myself and others uh, to represent the communities uh, of uh, you know, San Dimas, Laverne, and Claremont, and including Upland. I mean, when I first got elected, um, I was biting my nails because the San Bernardino vote was coming in before the LA County vote. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm behind. Um, to where we got, uh, before reapportionment just took place again, we got to the place where communities like Upland uh, were starting to vote stronger for us um, and some of the other Eastern parts. But, um, but I will say that you've always um, been kind to me uh, from the very first that we've had a chance to meet. You opened your doors, you had get togethers, you listened to what I had to say and, uh, and you supported me and you supported me along the way and I really do appreciate it. Um, and we'll always hold you all dear uh, in my thoughts. Uh, but like I said earlier, uh, if I felt like I was done, if I felt like mm, I'm exhausted, I just don't have any more, you know, I, I wanna do something different, I'd let you know that. Uh, that's not how I'm feeling. Uh, I'm working on some ideas and working with the governor's office and trying to put some things together. So I will keep you alert uh, as uh, they start to take form um, and to become real. And, uh, and then we can, because I, I need a short-term plan and then I need a long-term plan. And a short-term plan uh, has to be how do, uh, you know, we keep, uh, how do we keep uh, the bills getting paid? Uh, and I've got a lot of years in PERS and I have actually, you know, they don't pay you on a city council. So my PERS numbers in terms of income is very, I'm being very transparent here, by the way, um, yeah. to, to let you know that, uh, you know, my, my priorities are there, but my long-term is to uh, position myself where, you know, if all of you think it's a good idea and the pathway looks good for me four years from now, then we can give it another shot. And I, I think we would be very successful. Thank you so much. So thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, Zephyr, did you want to make your, your announcement before we transition to our general membership meeting portion? Okay. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, remember the assemblyman said his, re regarding his campaign, financing the campaign is very important. So therefore, we're attempting to do exactly that with the Tri-Counties 
Democratic Club on Saturday, June the 22nd from 11 to 2. We are having a um, luncheon, and it's a fundraising type of luncheon, awards luncheon, and you're all invited. Uh, this is fundraising because we have some uh, candidates in California for Congress. If we can get them in, it will change the composition in the House of Representatives. That's important if we want to change it. So um, I I think I have sent some of the information to Matt, and he might want to get it out to you, but it's going to be at the Double Tree. Hotel off of Temple in Diamond Bar, and that's from 11 to 2 p.m. Saturday, the 22nd. So come out and join other Democrats, and we usually have a good time together. Thanks. Thank you so much, Zephyr, for that announcement. I'll follow up this meeting with uh, another email out to our members. Uh, to remind them of that event and fundraising opportunity. I am going to conclude this speaker's program with uh, a lot of thanks. Uh, thank you, Assemblymember Holden, for joining us again uh, and extending your hour beyond the limit of the hour. So thank you for the conversation. Thank you for sharing your legacy of service. Um, we could probably speak with you for hours upon hours and still not um, scratch the surface. So we are so fortunate to have had you uh, serving our district. Uh, we all enjoyed meeting you as candidate Holden and getting better acquainted uh, with you through your years of service to the 41st Assembly District. So um, I know there's still a few months left and we are looking forward to your continued service in the remaining time that you have. And we're looking forward to your, your next steps. So uh, again, thank you for joining us. And uh, we will conclude this portion of the program and transition to our membership. Go ahead, Mr. Oh, Matt. Yeah, I, if I could, I just wanted to, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I know my time is up. I, this yeah. will be very quick, but I just want to say that I could not have been nearly as successful in the things that I've been able to do representing the district if it weren't for having uh, and I know you have another hat on that you're wearing today, Matt, but I have to acknowledge your role and in, in the things that I've been able to do. You have been very much a part of our success, and I want to thank you publicly and thank you for your family's commitment to this cause as well and your amazing service to uh, the 41st District. Thank you. Thank you. Also, Matt, we have uh, signs. Harrison, Biden signs and um, buttons if anybody's interested. And I'll send that information to you too. Bye bye. <laughs> okay. Have a good night.